Hello everybody and welcome to Literature Let Loose, courtesy of the Studio Online and the National Lottery Community Fund. You are about to listen to an audio story born out of the studio's response to COVID-19 and taken from the Studio Rights Adults and Kids Creative Writing Sessions. So relax, settle back and enjoy a selection of writing from some of the finest creative minds at the studio. Every Time Something Happens for the First Time by Richard Bradshaw Every Time Something Happens for the First Time Every time something happens for the first time, that is the last time it can. That is to say, it is the last time it can happen for the first time. Why would anyone squeal with delight at the sight of a brick in a wall, or the plaster covering one? Imagine a dust-choked miner as they strike gold or coal. Does that help? He was an ecologically minded architect and she was a beautifully minded interior designer, both utterly freelance, in love with life and each other. There are possibly women more beautiful in the world, but whenever Sarah walked into a room or passed anyone by in the street, nobody could remember ever having seen one. Her smile was one that sent clouds scurrying for cover and not finding any, off they went elsewhere. They had moved into houses before, spruced them up beyond recognition, sold them on and moved on themselves. But this one they'd fallen for and were already making vague plans for a long-term future in its embrace, which is how they thought of their presence in its presence. Even the laundry chute charmed them. The only time they ever saw dirty clothes was when either of them went down to the basement room to load the washing machine. A small thing in itself, mundane perhaps, but a feature on the right side of what they would choose to enjoy. The back garden was an oasis of quiet in the city that lay outside its walls, painted in ivy. The gate was a full-sized door in the brickwork and seemed to whisper of secrets beyond. You could easily imagine medieval monks passing through it although it was simply a path to the shortcut to the nearest shops and made going there seem like a wondrous daily adventure. The room which gave on to the garden had obviously been used for storage and was the least cared for in the house. A sin, they both agreed, and had left it to last in their renovation plans. Now it was time to resurrect it. Not only that, it was summer the perfect time to watch it be reborn into their care. There are many who consider stone to be a reservoir of the history of a building, but that which covers them can sing a song or two, at least for those who listen to such things. They listened. This is my version of what they heard. I believe I am telling the truth, but then discounting liars. We all do that. I once trod on a box of matches that had been left on the floor. This caused tremendous mirth amongst those present in the room at the time and was recounted on several occasions in my presence to others that weren't, causing much vicarious amusement to all. The reason for my fame in this matter is due to the fact that my stepping on the box crushed it and so rubbed the matches together inside causing them all to catch fire at once. As I recall the event, I leapt like a gazelle, though other narrators have left me with a somewhat less graceful description. What we all agreed on, however, is that both my feet left the ground as I made my attempt at a vertical escape from this sudden smoking inferno. Despite some embellishments, I did not touch the ceiling, though I'm quite happy to admit that I tried. I don't recall making a sound. Others do. This comes to mind because of what follows. With some, it might be the sudden appearance of a spider or a rat at a time and place it should not be, i.e. here, now. 
with Sarah. It was the wallpaper which was revealed when she stripped off enough of the top layer to see it properly. As she would relate it to friends, it offended every fibre of her being and her craft. Hideous! Leave it at that. She claims, even as she laughs, to still shudder at the memory. Her piercing shriek was enough to bring Tim racing in from the garden, trowel in hand and ready to do battle with the crazed axe murderer or herd of rhinos that had obviously broken into the house and been its cause. She was flabbered and he was ghasted at the awful sight which greeted them and which only got worse as they looked. The consensus was a mystification as to how, why or how anyone could ever bring themselves to actually put up wallpaper like that. What was underneath, however, answered that one. This third layer was a veritable miracle of ugliness. In the absence of a flamethrower, you would have covered it with anything. Starving children, if need be. It had to be the same culprit in both cases. There couldn't be two like that, surely. Not on the same planet. Nothing quite so dramatic happened as the remaining two layers were revealed and removed, finally leaving a brick and mortar shell that was, in fact, quite acceptable as it was. Or at least would be with a good clean. They brushed this down and set the pressure washer to work. The next day they decided was a nice one to spend out and about. It was a pleasant enough sight to come home to. They set up a small garden table with a couple of chairs and would sit and ponder what to do with both the garden and the room itself. Empty space was their canvas and they could happily sit for an age at a time discussing possibilities. Details were what they dealt in, whether through their work or natural inclination. So the tip-tap, tip-tapping sound not only drew their attention as it would any householder, it lit a fire under their mutual curiosity as well. It was the rhythm. It altered. It wasn't a scratching or scraping like an animal or some poor gothic sod bricked up behind their newly liberated wall. Whatever it was, it didn't give them the feeling that it was seeking entry or exit but it somehow didn't seem inanimate either. They both thought of water. They knew enough about this detached property to dismiss the need for a plumber. There was nothing above this room from whence anything could drip, and it didn't adjoin the kitchen, utility room or bathroom in any way other than a wall. But it still made them think of water. Dripping water will make a sound but this is usually an unchanging, monotonous feature that will only change if the quantity of water or the surface it is falling upon alters in some way. Even water that drips into a bucket and changes its sound as the water in the bucket rises will eventually fill the bucket and become a repeating monotone. Besides, there was the source of the sound. It moved. They heard it in different parts of the house at different times. A funny thing was that neither of them felt it unwelcome. They just wondered. Nothing insisted. Nothing happened. It was there. That was all. They became as used to it as they would to the gentle creaking of a hanging basket on breezy days. One thing did happen. They stopped talking about making alterations to the room. Without any discussion of the matter, they simply stopped. It was nice enough as it was, and always the first room they spent any time in when they came back from being away from home at all. Happy times. A month or two later, Sarah had a two-day promotional junket, as she called it, in London and Tim had a short conference to attend in Bristol. They decided to get together as soon as they were both free and spend a few days just doing as they pleased in wherever they pleased to do it. In all, they were away just over a week, ten days maybe. They came back feeling rejuvenated, 
and glad to be home. The dripping had ceased. It was now replaced by a lapping sound, a quiet symphony of gentle drums, a river of echoes of waves lapping over each other again and again, on and on, always present without being constant, like a friendly breeze bathing a warm day. The overall feeling was one of unerring subtlety. Honestly, it was lovely. Then, at the tail end of a lazy afternoon that was gently sliding westward to allow the calm of early twilight to slowly take its place, they heard something that was new, different, and stood outside whatever understanding they had come to hold of all that had gone before. It was a... It was like a, or maybe more akin to, they could neither of them finish any sentence they began and looked at each other with a sense of sudden and very unexpected disconcertion or rather simple confusion. They were sitting in the garden as they had done all afternoon. They looked towards the house, back at each other and then back to the closed door of the room. Unspeakingly, they moved together to the door. The sound grew louder and softer, more than less distinct as they listened. The pulsing, beating heart of a tide that ebbed and rose, ebbed and rose. There was a heavy key in the door on the outside. They looked at the key, then at each other, and both shook their heads. Neither could remember having put it there. They certainly hadn't locked the door. They turned the key and pushed it open. What they saw was not possible. Instead of the smooth stone floor, there were worn steps leading down where there never had been. They sought and held each other's hand and wondered whether or not to be afraid. There were sounds they knew and sounds they didn't, but all were now somehow subservient to what they would later describe as a drone, a humming, almost a chant. The steps were almost submerged in water. They stepped inside. It wasn't so much the dark as a differing light their eyes had to grow accustomed to. Can a glow be invisible even as you see it? Apparently so. In a dream, yes, just a dream, I fell into a pond. It was full of infant children, some no more than babes. I panicked, both for my safety and theirs, and thrashed around in the crescendo of ripples I created in doing so. This continued until I realised that, myself apart, everyone else seemed to be very happy as they doggy paddled around me, laughing each and all. I stopped worrying and, as far as I can remember, woke up smiling. Sarah and Tim felt they were passing through the trailing wisp of a veil, a tapestry of fleeting emotions as they waded into the water that rose and rose like a scent as they became more deeply immersed within it. Gentle, calm water, warm and clear as a sunlit, aqueous prison. Think of birds alighting on and leaving a telegraph wire, each one leaving it trembling, quivering to a new form of an ever-changing rhythm. Or maybe a squirrel, cat or fox making its way along the same wire as if on a tightrope, the line swaying as they go. What were arriving and leaving, however, were not birds, nor animals of any kind. They were feelings. Feelings of trepidation, delight, fear, calm, solitude and union, coming and going like the lines of a song. They came to their senses, then came to a sense. They felt in the same moment, both empty and full. Looking around, they locked glances for a moment, both smiling. They began to swim, long, languid, easy strokes in the gliding droplets, liquid in the liquid. They almost knew the old man was there before they saw him. To all appearances, he was still an oarsman resting on his oars, but they could feel the movement in and out of the water. 
he raised his head slowly and said, Ask what you please. I can only tell you what you already know. You are not alone, not in this world nor any. The old man was aged like wine, robust to his own needs and unafraid of his own gentleness and seeming frailty. Two hands appeared, thrusting up from the water, took hold of one side of the boat and an old woman clambered slowly, nimbly into the boat in one movement to sit beside the old man. One of them spoke, though it was impossible to say which. The voice, or perhaps voices, said, We have lived here a long time. Now we would like to live here longer. May we? For an answer they received a sigh of welcome. Over time, certain other things were explained. Others have been here before you came. Some were afraid of us, some merely annoyed by us. Some were not curious enough, some were unbending, some just filled our sea with rubbish. When they met at the steps, they both began to climb wordlessly up, emerging into the same early twilight they had left, dry and warm to the bone. Some time later, White heard both by now and not quite so steady on their feet as they once were. They rarely left the house, almost never in fact. The garden gate remained closed. We leave it for the monks, they laughed. They had long lost touch with their friends, so when the phone rang one afternoon it was something of an event. It wasn't anything inofficial. It was Fiona, right out of the blue. Fiona had been a schoolmate of Sarah's and was an old close friend to both. Just a quick call, she explained that she was so busy she didn't even have time to tell him how busy she was. She went on to relate that her youngest sister, who some years earlier had emigrated to Australia, was returning to England to get married in the village church. She had phoned to invite them to the wedding. Perhaps they could even meet up some time before. That is, if she could find a moment to herself amidst all the self-multiplying arrangements she was inundated with. She said she would try and call round, maybe even bring Christine with her. The groom would be arriving near the date, work commitments and all that. You'll get a formal invite, of course, as soon as I can pick them up from the printers and get them written out. Do come. I've got to dash now, she added, and promptly did so. A few days later, there was a knock at the front door. They both rose and went together to answer it. A young woman in her thirties stood there, already smiling as the door swung open. Sarah spoke. Christine, she beamed and gushed on with barely a pause for breath. I'd know you when you look at her, Tim, the living image of Fiona, isn't she? Peas in a pod. Is she with you? I'm so looking forward. I haven't seen it in ten years or more. The last time was at that little wine and cheese affair in London, the Cleverby thing. Do you remember it, Tim? Oh, oh, silly me, of course you don't. You weren't there, were you? You were in Bristol. I can hardly wait. A few days later, there was a knock at the front door. They both rose and went together to answer it. A young woman in her thirties stood there, already smiling as the door swung open. Sarah spoke. Christine, she beamed and gushed on with barely a pause for breath. I'd know you anywhere. Look at her, Tim, the living image of Fiona, isn't she? Peas in a pod, is she with you? I'm so, so looking forward. I haven't seen her in ten years or more. The last time was at that little wine and cheese affair in London, the clever bee thing. Do you remember it, Tim? Oh, silly me, of course you don't. You weren't there, were you? You were in Bristol. I can hardly wait. Throughout the entirety of this babbled speech, Tim simply smiled in a peculiarly absent sort of way. The woman on the doorstep, however, looked and listened with a growing intensity, her smile transforming into a dropped jaw as she took in the sights and sounds before her. 
she became increasingly perplexed and appalled as it continued. The words were almost a blur, but she heard them all. It was what she saw, though, that was leaving her so completely flummoxed. The bedraggled snow-white hair, Tim's shiny, balding pate and matted, wispy beard, the stained, stinking, crumb-laden, unkempt clothes, the slip and slop of their slippers as they slouched and shuffled ahead of her, inviting her to follow. She couldn't follow. She couldn't move. Everything she saw screamed of neglect. Even from where she stood, she knew that a good wash wouldn't go amiss on either of them. She wondered if it could be dementia. But both of them? She seriously asked herself if she had the wrong house. No, this was Sarah and Tim, no doubt. Sarah, she said, smiling as gently as she could manage and making sure she included Tim in it as they turned back to face her. I'm not Christine. I'm Fiona. And after a long, quizzical look from both of them, added, And that clever bit shindig, that was three weeks ago. Mm-hmm.